to help to help fund this trip. Uh, in addition, this this lecture actually has two titles, and I hope you can bear all this. Craft lecture from the Department of English and for the linguistics program is the Quentin Johnson lecture. Quentin Johnson was a a long time and valued member of the Department of English and the Lectures program. And my colleague Dan Douglas from the English Department will introduce our speaker. Thank you. First, facts about the Henry President. He's a professor of linguistics at Michigan State University. Uh, he did his PhD work at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, he's, he works primarily in sociolinguistics, dialectology, ethnography, second language acquisition. Um, he also has interest in minority language education and has served as a consultant to uh, public school and higher education language programs around the country. Um, he's been a visiting professor at Hawaii, Arizona, Michigan, and has had Fulbright uh, appointments in Poland and Brazil. He's the current president of the American Dialect Society. He served on uh, the committee of the International Conference of Methods in Dialectology, in dialectology directed two NSF grants in folk linguistics and sociolinguistics. Um, and he's the uh, director of the 2003, already, um, the LSA, Lang uh, Linguistic uh, uh, Society of America Summer Institute at Michigan State, which will be held in Michigan State. Uh, he's a fellow of the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, and he uh, holds a medal of the university at Adam Mickiewicz University in Poland. Publications include, as many of you know by now, Folk Linguistics with Nancy Michielski, which is sitting over there, uh, a handbook of perceptual dialectology, sociolinguistics and second language acquisition, um, he edited American Dialect Research, and he's uh, currently the editor of language, the, the language section of the Encyclopedia of the Midwest, which will be published by Indiana University Press. He probably, arguably, is uh, the most creative author of titles in our profession. And I just want to read a selection of some of his uh, Publications beginning in 1973, the riveting study entitled Bituminous Coal Mining Vocabulary of the Eastern United States. <laughs> he uh, early on published a textbook of French entitled Do It in French. <laughs> 1980. 1982, Writing Folklore Down Wrong, Folklorist Failures in Phonology. How to Lose a Language, a Hungarian cookbook in 1982. Also, this was a big year in 1982. Lusty Language Learning, <laughs> Confessions on Acquiring Polish. 1983, he stuck with it. The Unicorn and the Virgin, the Basilisk and the Rabbit. <laughs> the Giffer, the Goofer, and the Good Old Boy. The Little Abner Syndrome, 1985. The well-known, the 50-some-odd categories of language variation in 1986. Before he came to Iowa, he published The Nicest English is in Indiana. Disputes. How come you do do like you do? It's almost over. <laughs> 1998. The names of U.S. English: Valley Girl, Cowboy, Yankee, Normal, Nasal, and Ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> and in press, this is a serious work: A Handbook of Perceptual Dialectology, Volume Two, or uh, uh, Second Edition. Uh, 
Dennis is, as he told us this afternoon in the seminar, half Hungarian, half hillbilly from Western Kentucky. Uh, one of his great uh, disappointments in life is that he inherited the uh, Hungarian part in terms of stature, and he was always too short for basketball. He speaks English, Spanish, Polish, Portuguese, German, Kosa, bad Hungarian, and bad Japanese. Recreation, he enjoys food. He's a particular fan of Battles Barbecue here in Ames, which was developed in 1994. Uh, hamburgers, tenderloins, which he discovered at Gilbert in 1994 as well. He claims to be a gourmet cook at home and uh, is a wine aficionado. He plays jazz piano, saxophone, and clarinet. And he has an acting uh, career in his background. Uh, at uh, playhouses in Louisville, Cincinnati, and the Pittsburgh Playhouse. And he claims that he can recite Macbeth from memory after a couple of years. We're <laughs> <laughs> welcoming the 2001 Quentin Johnson Lecture, Professor Dennis Preston. concentric circles, uh, finding the, the local delicacies, and indeed we found many around here. So I'm, I'm delighted to be back. I'm happy to be a lecturer in some place where I've been before. Uh, Dan and I have known each other as he introduced me this afternoon for, for years that we've already forgotten, uh, or at least I have, I'm, I'm a little older than Dan, as you might suspect. But I'm, I'm happy to be here, uh, back here with lots of friends, people I taught with uh, in 94, and, and people I see in all kinds of venues, writing encyclopedias of the Midwest, and, going to AAAL and TESOL conferences in the Whiskey Society of America. So I'm, I'm happy to be on your turf now, uh, rather than to have you on, on one of mine. I'm going to talk tonight about, uh, actually, I think a philosophy of language more than anything else. Because uh, although I want to, this could be bad. There we go. Oh, we're all right. Sorry. Some of you are familiar with this uh, sort of theory of everything that anybody could ever say about linguistics. Uh, if, if you have areas of linguistic research which aren't represented here, don't tell me about them. I, I don't want to know. They're all here. <laughs> the top of this triangle is what engages most of us most of the time. It's what people say. That is the actuality of human language. But please notice that lurking behind A, there's an A prime, and this is in fact what we really do. Uh, because if, in fact, we just went around collecting boxes of sentences, we would end up, of course, with big boxes of sentences and couldn't sell any of them. So obviously, we need some explanatory stuff which stands behind them. And those, of course, are states and processes and cognitive realities or whatever, which empower language use. But there are two other sides to this linguistic triangle. Well, if there's one and, and it's a triangle, there better be two more, right? Uh, the second one, I think, is what most people think of as the social psychology of language. And this is not what people say, but this is how people react to what is said. Because uh, certainly when I first started teaching in Wisconsin and Michigan and, and places like that and talk like this, which is pretty much my native dialect, it was simply a given that a lot of people didn't pay very much attention to what I had to say at all. Because how I was saying it was so dang interesting that they could hardly get past this Kentucky, Southern Indiana stuff to pay attention to what I was saying. So if you don't believe that people react to the way people say things, then surely the demonstration I just gave you, uh, as I return now to my Michigan teaching voice, uh, <laughs> will have convinced you. And obviously lurking behind that is the same kind of explanatory stuff, that, the cognitive stuff which lurks behind our empowerment of language. There's also lurking behind that a whole set of beliefs and attitudes. Some of them aren't even linguistic. They simply have to do with people's identities, whether or not we believe that they marry first cousins too much, don't wear shoes before they're 21 and have all memorized moonshine liquor recipes before they get to go to school. And uh, some of what I said before surely awakened some of those uh, facts in, uh, in your mind. But on the C corner of the triangle is something that's been much less exploited. Uh, and Nancy and I have just committed to print a book called Folk Linguistics, although both of us and a few other people have been talking about folk linguistics for quite a while. 
And here we are playing around not so much with the A and B sides of the triangle, for we seem to be emphasizing the degree to which people don't have consciousness, don't have awareness about linguistic facts. First of all, I don't want to spend much time on that because I think it's actually a continuum. And the whole business of what awareness and consciousness is is much too often simply bifurcated into, well, you're either aware or you're unaware. I suspect that you're aware along a very long continuum and that that implies lots of different things. But I, in folk linguistics, we're, we're really talking about stuff that people talk about. And when you think about it, there's a sense in which linguistics in the real world is maybe more interesting on this side than the other two kinds of linguistics. Because it is, after all, legislators and teachers and trainers and teachers and lots and lots of other people who confront the facts of linguistics with their folk knowledge, with their overt folk knowledge. So they have beliefs about language and they hold certain truths about language which they, they hold very dear. Uh, and they are, they are part of what I want to explore tonight, uh, namely a philosophy of language. We, we certainly won't look at a complete philosophy of language, but I hope a folk theory of language which will uh, come close to uh, some things that will be real for you. I woke up in Hawaii one night uh, when I was visiting professor there. I'd been sent there for bad behavior or something. I'm not sure why. <laughs> And it suddenly occurred to me, gosh, what if I took some blank maps of places and asked people to draw outlines and boundaries of where we're, around where they think dialect areas are rather than where there really are dialect areas? I said, gosh, I bet you could learn a whole bunch of stuff from that. So I quickly went over to the geography department and said, uh, I just had this really brilliant idea. And the cultural geographer says, yeah, 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 but we've been doing this for a long time. So I went off and read uh, books like Peter Gould's Mental Maps and other really very interesting things. They didn't exactly do what I had in mind, but I saw that, in fact, cultural geographers had also been interested in mental or cognitive representations of space as well as the actual representations of space. So now I wanted to be interested in cognitive or mental representations of space in terms of language variation. So if you hand a blank map of the United States uh, to a person from Michigan and give them the following instructions, draw areas around and label those places where people speak differently in the country. Don't ask them to draw areas and uh, labels of dialect areas because dialect means something very different uh, in folk linguistic terminology from what it means in our technical terminology. For the most part, dialect means where people talk bad, uh, rather, rather than where people talk different. So this is, here's a, a very nice Michigan map. There are Eskimos in Alaska. People speak Sunnyside out in California. The most important thing is that right there in Michigan, and in Michigan alone, are where average, <laughs> normal people live. <laughs> There are some interesting British people over here. I suspect this is because it's New England, and so that tells us a little bit about this. There are Southerners down here, and then hillbillies, and then as if a kind of euphemism or clean up your act, so you don't sound too insulting. These, uh, these hillbillies are further identified as Texans. Here's a Chicago map, which is a great deal more detailed. But again, I have to read this to you. These are, these are actual maps of what people really did, so they're obviously not very clean. But here it says, normal talk for the average person. And the circle is, guess where, right on Chicago. <laughs> now, what's very interesting is that, remember, the Michigan guy before told you that they were normal and average in Michigan. Ah, but the Chicago guy has another theory. Over in Detroit, there's black fro talk because of the large percentage of blacks. Now, one wonders what happened to all the black people of Chicago. Uh, because for some reason, this guy's sitting over here telling us that these people are average and normal, and they're not average and normal over here because there's a very large black population. Uh, maybe he hasn't toured Chicago like that, but I have news for him. There are a large number of black people in Chicago. So I think one of the things that operates within linguistic theory about local realization is that, uh, to borrow a term from ancient theoretical linguistics, people are capable of ethnic pruning or dialect pruning. In a lot of the debriefing that we did, because when most of these people drew maps, of course, we didn't just send them away and thank them. We talked to them afterwards. So we talked to these Michigan people, and we would annoy them by saying things like, uh, well, you say a Michigan talk is normal and average, but didn't you say earlier in this tape that black people didn't speak good English? What about all the black people in Detroit? Oh, I didn't count them. So it's a very, very interesting fact that somehow when we characterize language stuff, we can not only identify our place as normal, but we can identify us as the normal ones in that place, and we're the real representatives, not the other people. So uh, uh, ethnic, ethnic pruning, I think, is a kind of nicer dialect. Pruning is a nice term for this. 
Now, <laughs> nothing gets to be normal and good unless it has a foil. And I think it's a very important point of Tolkien linguistics. You can't have good language unless you have bad language. And where is bad language? Well, I've got an idea. A guy from uh, Alabama drew this map, and it's pretty clear that he's got a bipartite view of America. It's a simple, straightforward one. Some of us even have some historical ideas about where notions like this might have come from. But it's more complicated than this. Here's a guy from South Carolina, also an authentic Southerner, who draws a circle around where he is from and calls it Southern. Very slow, hard to comprehend. This is not the same kind of view of his language that the Michigander had. Michigander called their speech normal, ordinary. And later you'll even see more exaggerated claims, some of which you heard Nancy make this afternoon about speakers of standard language in Michigan. They, on the other hand, they clearly don't like some places. This is the universally most disliked linguistic place in America. Uh, that is the thing that's focused right on New York City, because there's a New Jersey accent where they twist words in their mouths and are nasal sounding. I assure you, much nastier things about are said about New York English than stuff like this. But notice this. This guy who is not from the Midwest doesn't even draw a circle around it, just writes a big letters up there, Midwest doesn't have accent. So the normal perception of the Midwest is not just a perception held by Midwesterners. It's one which they, in some way, have interestingly imposed on others as well. Here's another Southerner uh, whose comment I like very much because I think it shows the nice dichotomy between the two possible perceptions of Southern speech. First of all, notice that he's got a northern scratch and claw dialect. Probably not much <laughs> phonetic reality to that, but we know what he means. But down here is this dialect, this is another South Carolinian, by the way, who says, South, courteous and gentlemanly, but also spoken by ignorance. So <laughs> this guy, who is a Southerner himself, is wrapping up two of these interesting caricatures about the South. And we find this out, I think, by, by looking at these kinds of maps. Here's another Southerner. This is, a, this is a, a young woman from Alabama. And she's got southern drawl and southern twang. So obviously the drawlers are over here and the twangers are over here. <laughs> By the way, in the folk linguistic phonetic caricatures of American English, there are three most frequent terms. Nasal, twang, and drawl. They turn up more frequently than any other descriptors which could possibly have anything to do with phonology. But look at this. Good English is again up here, and again written by a southerner. And I just want those of you in the audience to know this good English even cuts into here in a place that should be close and dear to your hearts, although it appears to be focused on Wisconsin, which is a kind of strange concept as far as I'm concerned, since I went to graduate school there and know what Wisconsin English is really like. <laughs> now, I can't read some of this because the guy, I'm not exactly sure what kind of stylus he worked with, just to read. <laughs> Remember in the old days when we used the word city in this interesting way, that a, that, a, that a place was characteristic of a certain kind of activity, we called it city. Oh man, the kids were out last night, that was drunk city, right? So this is rebel city down here. This is hard to read, but it's called uh, full Ivy League influence. There's always, a little, there's always a little snotty perception by us Midwesterners and Southerners about what's going on up here, annoying, scratch and claw, Ivy League. But here's another concept of the Midwest, which I think you'll find not too happy. And it refers, I think, to this populist kind of notion. This is the boring Midwest. Yes, you're there, just like the Michiganders. But I show you this map only for the main reason that if anyone after this talk can define to me why it is that there's a bird talk area and a dog talk area, I'd uh, be happy to learn the uh, explanation. Now let's get more serious. I actually, th these maps are serious because there's a lot of interesting ethnographic information, I think, involved in, in where these things are drawn, what labels are put on them, really a lot of, a lot of interesting stuff. But we did a kind of, uh, when we first started doing this, we did a computational overkill. Uh, I actually, uh, well, I didn't sit down, I, should, I shouldn't say that, the graduate student sat down, uh, <laughs> in front of a digitizing map, a uh, digitizing pad, placed each hand-drawn map on that digitizing pad and traced an outline around the area's drawing. That, of course, fired all the pixels within that territory. Once that's done, then you can do statistical analyses of the areas that were drawn by 50 people, by 100 people. 
And so what we did with 147, this, yes, this did keep graduate students employed for quite some time. We did 147 of these maps from southeastern Michigan. Of course, we did the usual sociolinguistic stuff. We divided them up into the higher class, lower class, young, old, and so forth. But let's not mess with that. These are all 147. And these outlines that you see here are those computer realizations. That is, this is the, the well-agreed upon territory of the South. Notice the South always cuts off South Florida. Uh, and that's not an accident of drawing a circle, because lots of people would do stuff like this if they wanted to include it. And here's an interesting generational change, by the way, in dialect folk linguistics. If you ask older people why this is not a part of the South, they will tell you because of northern retirees. Uh, if you ask younger people why this is not a part of the South, they'll tell you that's because Spanish is spoken there. So there's been a real generational change about why it is that South Florida is not a part of the South. There are probably some people on the cusp of that generational change who believe in both of those facts. But the important thing I want you to notice here is that the number of people who drew a South from Michigan was 138 out of 147. 94% of the people who were asked to do this task drew a South and drew a South first. So part of this Michigan ideology or Midwestern ideology about correct language is in fact not so much focused on correctness as it is on incorrectness. We're not from there. That's where the funny people are from. So my first message to the Westerners is, wait for us, y'all wouldn't be so damn good, right? Because you, know, you got to have us down here being wrong. Now, admittedly, at 54%, you've got a secondary trough of nastiness up around here, around here. <laughs> And then, of course, we got y'all's beautiful selves up here at 61%. But look at the drop between the least correct place, 94%, to the home correct region, 61%. So I don't care where you have dialect uh, maps drawn in the United States, the most salient speech area in the United States is the South. Now, if this was just a dialect task, why wouldn't people simply draw boundaries where the dialects are most distinct? That's what a linguist would do, right? These people are not drawing dialects. These people are drawing from their philosophy of language. And their philosophy of language is, is that there's a right way to do things and there's a wrong way to do things. And the most salient places, and I think the numbers show this very clearly, are the worstest place, the bestest place, and the next worstest place. And after that, it really begins to drop off. Uh, there's, there's a number six in here, a kind of upland south, because a lot of people don't make a distinction uh, between sort of coastal southern and, and upland southern, but notice it's up there around number six. So these incredibly salient areas then are not those that I first thought. My first interest was, well, let's go back and compare where real people draw dialects and look, then look at where dialects really are. But if you do that, <coughs> this, is a ma this is a lexical map of the United States which was compiled by Don Lance a few years ago. That is, he went through all of the old dialect work that had been done since the, since the beginnings of time, but all on lexicon, and said, okay, what do we know about boundaries based on vocabulary in American English? Look at this boundary right here. This is a big time boundary. If you drop down from Coldwater, Michigan, and come over here into Fort Wayne, you've crossed one of the more important dialect boundaries in the United States. Nobody ever draws it. <coughs> So the distinction between folk linguistics and real linguistics is one that says, if the people who live on both sides of these lines have no caricature, no stereotype, no disqualifying features like Southern English, uh, and if we can prune ethnicity and other non-standard locals out of it, then you can do all the linguistic features you like, but we won't notice them, and we won't draw anything there. And this is not just old time lexical stuff. Here's Bill LeBoff's most recent map on work that he's been doing of phonology in the United States. Look where that line runs. So if you don't believe in words, then you must believe in noises, right? I'm a noise man myself. I don't care much for words. But that line runs in exactly the same place. That's a big time dialect boundary. Nobody ever draws a dialect boundary there. People believe in some kind of Great Lakes, Michigan, Wisconsin centered dialect, which of course doesn't exist at all. My claim is that it exists cognitively for them because they know it's a really great place. <clears throat> now when you talk about this stuff overtly in terms of folk linguistics, people will just tell you this stuff. One of the reasons that we were very successful, I think, uh, uh, when Nancy and I first started recording this uh, for, for an old NSF grant that we had when you were still, John, you are, importantly knows what I was, uh, 
So we have some non-native uh, speaking field workers. And non-native speakers get to ask really stupid questions. One of my favorite things is to be a foreigner. Because when you go to another place, you can just behave like a complete ignoramus and everybody says, no, oh, I'm just a foreigner, right? But you get to ask really interesting questions because you can ask questions about low-level pragmatic behavior, which if you ask in your own culture, you would say, hmm, well, everybody knows that. But you don't get to say everybody knows that to a foreigner. So here's a, here's a young man, a uh, Chinese interviewer sent out by me. So he says, so, you know, where do, where do you think standard English is spoken? This is a kind of dumb question coming from a native speaker. Well, we think, says this Michigander, uh, the Midwest. But now here's this very interesting thing. What's this laughter about after Detroit? <laughs> Gee, his wife is having a little trouble doing this ethnic pruning. She knows that Detroit has a very large black population, and so this standard English business has given her just a little trouble. The Midwest, says the Chinese guy, and then the sun jumps up. The Midwest, no, because Dad, I, I've been to California a lot more than you. Uh, California talks the same way as here. And all of a sudden, the Midwest goes all the way to the West Coast. There's no accent. I can't tell the difference. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I can't, I can't either when I'm in California. So, so like the Western, the North, and the South would basically be the two accents. This guy's doing the same thing that the Southerner did when he just said us and damn Yankees. Except and then they get a little nervous, uh, uh, like the New Yorkers. And again, laughter. Oops, we forgot those bad guys uh, out on the East Coast. So eventually, even in conversational data, it supports, I think, this, this map drawing task of philosophy to suggest that there are these just two really ugly places. And they support the well-known stereotype uh, that national newscasters sound like people from Michigan. There are actually some people who believe, there's a wonderful myth in Michigan, that when newscasters are trained, they are sent to some secret talk camp somewhere in Michigan, <laughs> and it's there that they learn to talk like they all talk. Now, the interesting thing about this, and the thing I want to point out to you about the power of folk linguistics, this with the incredible counter evidence that one of the major national newscasters is a Canadian and sounds like a Canadian, and that the other major national newscaster is a Texan and sounds like a Texan. So how we can say that the other one is, in fact, a kind of upper Midwesterner. Uh, but but how, you know, how we can sort of tolerate the, the continuance of this myth in the face of reality, I think, shows us the power uh, of this cognitive stuff. Now, one of the reasons we first started doing folk linguistics is we thought that social psychologists of language were on the wrong track. Here's why we thought they were on the wrong track. They would play tape samples of people's speech and ask them to rate them along certain lines like happy, sad, fast, slow, and so forth. Very typical social psychology of language stuff. And then they would end up saying things like, people from Iowa believe that speakers of South Midlands English are happy, sad, fast, slow, and so forth after doing factor analyses and other magical statistical work. What they didn't do, and what we were critical of, was the fact that they played <coughs> these dialects but didn't ask the people who listened to them where they really thought the speaker was from. So the speaker wasn't reacting to a South Midlands dialect. Real people don't talk about South Midlands dialects. Yeah? That's dialectologists talk. We, you know, we get together at the American Dialect Society and say South Midlands, but you can't you know, come into this bar on a non-linguistic night and hear people sitting around the corner saying, you know, well, did you hear those South Midlands speakers the other night? <laughs> oh, no, no, I think he's a North Midlands speaker myself. Oh, I hope you'll hear that. So it doesn't happen. <laughs> now, I don't mean that people don't talk about language. We couldn't do both linguistics if they didn't talk about language, but they don't talk about the same terms we do. But these are the terms they use, right? These are the cognitively real areas that they've got. So what we did was take this map and give it right back to them. And another thing that we did, and I think we were justifiably critical of social psychology of language, is that when they first started doing these so-called matched eye studies in Canada, they decided on a pair of adjectives that they used and then used and then used and used and used and never bothered to ask people if those pairs of adjectives were meaningful to them. The way you're supposed to do this is go back to the speech community and find what terms are salient to that group. I just had a young man uh, from Kenya who finished his PhD, and he did some social psychology of language work on varieties of African English. And he took the famous old pairs of adjectives and went to a kind of test group of African respondents. And they all handed it back to him and said, what do these words mean? Now, these weren't uneducated speakers. They were speakers who simply said, these words don't tell us anything about language. He said, oops, maybe we better back up and do something like this. Get the words from them which describe African varieties of English. You know what the most salient word was? Proud. Proud and not proud, but not in a positive sense. 
the main feature that Africans wanted to use, that black Africans wanted to use to rate African English was the empathy, speaking like you wanted to be like the colonialist white speaker. And without this adjective proud, we wouldn't have had the most salient rating characteristic for these speakers. So you don't find out what people think about language, again, from the point of view of folk linguistics, unless you ask them. It's a kind of straightforward, simple thing to say. These are the adjectives that Michiganders gave us. We showed them this map of their own, with their own cognitively real areas, and we would say, well, what would you say about language? And notice, by the way, that twang and drawl and nasal all show up. You can't do American folk linguistics unless you've got those three terms. I don't want to claim that they always mean the same thing, because they're not linguistic terms. And then there's some other, of course, very interesting things. Notice that, in fact, as in my Africans experiment, snobbish showed up. We haven't seen this on any earlier lists in the social psychology of language. We did this, and not very surprisingly, for all of the regions that I just showed you, did the uh, statistical mysteries of a factor analysis and turned up two large factor groups. Well, all social psychologists of language will say, what do you expect, kid? Uh, you're going to get one factor group, which has to do with the overt prestige of speech communities. People are smart, people are educated, people are normal, they speak good English, they don't have a drawl. And you're going to get another factor group, which has to do with the covertly prestigious, warm and fuzzy, home feelings kind of stuff. People are polite, they're friendly, they're down to earth, they're normal and they're casual. The interesting thing about Northerners is when we look at their ratings and we rated them for their North, so these are Michiganders ratings of the North and these are Michiganders ratings of the South, we begin to find that Michiganders, although they are very happy with their own speech, they're not as happy and they don't put as much symbolism in their own friendliness and casualness as they even attribute to Southerners. Now, this is a scale of one to six. So when Michiganders say they have no drawl and the mean score is 5.11, anybody who's done any social science research with scales will recognize that on a 1.6 to get a mean score above five means that people are going to the edge. And people don't like to go to the edge on, mean, on ratings. They, they like to hover around the middle so they don't seem prejudicial or exaggerating. So these Michiganders have no drawl, they have no twang, they're normal, they're smart, they speak good English. They're down to earth, they're maybe a little too fast, they're pretty well educated, but look at the bottom of the scale for their own speech. Friendly, polite, not nasal, and casual almost comes down to the mid-range of the scale. Now it's true they believe about Southerners what you would expect they would believe. Southerners have a drawl, they're slow, they're uneducated, they speak bad English, they got a twang, they're dumb and they're abnormal. Well, we knew that about Southerners. <laughs> but what we didn't know is that Southerners are rated much better than the home people themselves. And in fact, look at this, casual at the very bottom, casual at the very top. So not everything about the South is a bad place. And I think what we're beginning to discover here is something I think I'll show you a little more clearly in some maps that I've unfortunately shown maybe too often, but I think they come a lot closer to this kind of ideology. On a scale of 1 to 10, we ask Michiganders, where's the best English spoken? Well, only Michigan is black. <laughs> it gets an 8. And again, on a scale of 1 to 10, a mean score in the 8 range is a very high score. And look at this disastrous trip. Michigan to Indiana lose two points, Kentucky lose another point, Tennessee lose another point, and Alabama, holy mackerel, off the face of the linguistic curve, yeah? <laughs> Alabama is a three. So that, that's a pretty big trip for correctness, and that means that on a rating scale, you've got mean scores that all go all the way from three to eight. So to say that Michiganders are linguistically secure is, I think, not to say enough. <laughs> but, if you remember this other one where we tease stuff out with the factor analysis, when you ask Michiganders where the nicest or most pleasant English is spoken, all of a sudden they're down to seven, not up to eight. Not only that, they're no longer alone. <coughs> Guys in Illinois and Minnesota and Colorado and Washington are just as pleasant as they are. Not only that, Alabama's not so bad. I mean, it's still not a real nice place, uh, but it's down only in four. And this star, of course, indicates New York City, but you knew that. <laughs> now go to Alabama and ask people the same questions. And the first thing I want you to look at is this correctness thing. First of all, this would make a person from Michigan just faint or throw up or something else. <laughs> Alabama to Michigan is no change. It's just five in the middle. 
It's not good English, it's not bad English. Uh, I, I, in fact, don't show this map very often in Michigan because I have to bring smelling salts and stuff along, right? Of course, now Alabama's real good, but there's, there's a little of this twanginess right out here to the west that's not quite so good. And of course, uh, uh, New Jersey and New York City are, are down here in the, in the three territory uh, for correctness, but, but we knew that. So it seems to me that what we discover is that people with a great deal of linguistic security, like those in Michigan, and I think without doing the research, like those in Iowa and Minnesota uh, and Wisconsin and lots of other upper Midwestern regions, <laughs> spend their linguistic capital, I don't want to be too Marxist tonight, but I can be half Marxist half, they spend their linguistic capital on language correctness. And once you've invested your linguistic capital in language correctness, you don't have any capital left over for pleasantness and home folksy stuff. So you gotta get some other symbols. I don't mean to say that Michiganders are not friendly and home folksy people, but it's not invested in language. It's invested in eating pasties and watching hockey and stuff like that. But it's not invested in language. So if two Michiganders uh, run into one another in Lithuania and hear somebody on the other side of the room speaking, they say, oh, a Michigan accent, and run over and embrace the person on linguistic grounds. Doesn't happen. There's two old boys like me in Lithuania. I hear somebody on the other side of the room talking like this, then I'm going to run up and say, damn, where are you from, anyhow? Yeah? I mean, so the solidarity stuff, or the, or the stuff that's invested in language pleasantness, is something that you can spend, especially if you've already been told by Northerners and Midwesterners that you don't have the other. And so here's a map of Alabama, and if you don't believe it's true, what does this map remind you of? Alabama pleasantness is just Michigan correctness. But focus on pleasantness, again, it's an eight. And Michigan, no, that's, that's not such good stuff, right? And uh, in fact, a really interesting thing, which doesn't show up very well here, but you can, I think, see it, is that New Jersey actually gets a two, uh, the lowest rating ever given. <laughs> so notice that it's also the breadth of the scale, right? You can tell what people are invested in because they're using an eight to two scale, just like Michiganders, right, used an eight to three scale. But on the pleasantness stuff, none of the Michiganders didn't have so much today to say. And on the correctness scale, the Alabamians didn't have enough to say. In fact, them poor ignorant Alabamians actually believe that their English was correct as that in Michigan, but lots of other places as well. Now we'll tell you about this. <clears throat> now I think that this folk linguistic stuff is so profound that it actually affects your ears. I prepared a tape of uh, middle-aged European-American men from each one of these places. All of them were college graduates, but with no postgraduate training. I played these voices in scramble order from four people from southeastern Michigan and from Nobney, Indiana, which is the correct pronunciation of new, what you think might be new Albany or even horror of horrors, new Albany. It's just Nobney. Uh, <coughs> it's right it's right on the Ohio River. It's a suburb of Louisville, Kentucky. Let me play you just the first two of these voices. Number one. In high school, and well, especially in junior high, it was drill. You know, when you play games with drills and all that kind of thing. Uh, what do you call it? Diagramming sentences. All those things. And then in high school, writing papers had a lot to do with it. Where is he from? Nashville, or Nashville, I think, as you correctly say in the Midwest. <laughs> Although I assure you that in Nashville, you don't want to go around saying Nashville. It's just Nashville. Number two. And I noticed when I went to the city high school, and because we were involved in church activities, that the people who were in the choir, which I was a member, particularly the pretty girls, okay, did have an accent that I was not aware of when I was in high school, uh, before I went away to high school. Where's that one from? Michigan. Oh, it's South Bend. The guy can't possibly be from Michigan. Uh, he doesn't have some of the characteristics of the northern city shift, but I'll get to that later. Uh, now, what's really interesting about this is that real people who took this test did better than dialectologists. That is, they heard dialect boundaries in places where there weren't any dialect boundaries. 
And I think that's because real people are simply paying attention to some features that linguists don't pay attention to. American linguists, for example, are notoriously bad at paying attention to intonational or supersegmental characteristics when they study dialect, although British linguists and others pay a great deal of attention to it. That's one thing. Secondly, American dead linguists have tended to codify sounds as if they were either I or I. Now, I know. When I get in my car and drive down from central Michigan, that my I, which I put on for my students, does not immediately go to my native I. That I go through an I, 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 I <laughs> continuum. And my guess is that real people pay attention to the same stuff. Dialectologists very seldom pay attention to continuum shifts. They have a tendency to say, to say stuff like I stops here and I starts. And I reckon they don't. Uh, I'm just betting you that if you took some synthesized stuff, and Nancy has done some of this work, not exactly the way that I have in mind here, but that if you synthesize, for example, the fronting of that vowel along with the lack of diphthongization of that vowel, that you could produce a really nice experiment, or a really nice experiment, depending on how you felt, uh, about how far north or south the voice was, and determine with a great deal of sophistication the degree to which individual linguistic elements either do or do not awaken some folk linguistic facts. And I think now with the synthesizing procedures that produce relatively elegant speech, we can do some of this stuff. But what's most impressive here is a result of the statistical analysis, which I will not bore you with. <clears throat> Interesting thing is that the same tapes were played for people from Michigan and for people from Indiana, and they heard boundaries in different places, although they heard the same tape. Look what the Michiganders heard. They heard everybody, right, from Muncie, Indiana on up with no differentiation. But do you remember the maps that they drew? They drew circles around that territory. All those speakers are just good speakers. There's, in fact, two very interesting dialect boundaries in that territory, which people from southern Indiana apparently hear. Now, I'm not so sure they really hear it, but I know this, that these guys think this is all the same, and then they differentiate some southernness. I bet it's on the basis of some stereotypes, like the degree of eye fronting and monophthongization. On the other hand, look down here. From New Albany, Indiana, all the way down to Dothan, Alabama, where, as you remember from the previous maps I showed you, there's some very interesting dialect boundaries. These guys in New Albany say, no, there's no difference between us and the guys all the way down here. But one step up, there's a little difference there, and then boom, boom, all of a sudden, these northern scratch and claw dialects are very much differentiated. So folk linguistics, I think, from, from this perspective, is in fact so powerful that the acoustic data themselves are not very interesting. My favorite anecdotal proof of this is a guy from Finley, Ohio, <clears throat> for his entire life, had been infected with the Meads past participle construction. The Meads past participle construction makes its way into Iowa, although it's not nearly as strong here as it is in western Pennsylvania and parts of central Ohio. It is sentences of the sort like, my shoes need shined, uh, my clothes need washed, my car needs fixed. This young man got a PhD at Indiana University uh, and went on to a distinguished career of Slavic linguistics until he met me one day um, in Poznań in Western Poland and said, eh, you smart aleck dialectologist, you can't tell where I'm from. I said, you're from Fenley, Ohio. Oh, he said, how'd you know that? I said, well, then I listed a number of phonological features. And I said, well, by the way, I didn't pr produce it exactly, but you use this really fairly limited and unusual needs plus past participle construction. What's that, he said. I said, you know, sentences like my clothes need washed, my shoes need shine. He says, yeah, everybody says that. He <laughs> <laughs> everybody that says that. Just, just some of you guys go in a pretty narrow band across the Midwest. It sort of peters out in Kansas and Iowa and Nebraska and get further west, you don't hear from it at all. Now, this was a European-American, well-educated person from Northwestern Ohio. He had no distinguishing stereotypical characteristics in his behavior, except for being a Slavic linguist, and that's just so weird that you don't even think about it. Um, but other than that, this was a super plus normal guy. So not only did he not recognize it, he had lived his whole life through his PhD, and no one had ever bothered to call it to his attention, except for me, that dialectologists are not kind. And so since we were in a foreign country at the time, we had access to a lot of native speakers from all over the United States and Britain. And I said, well, you don't believe me, just take a little tour. 
So he went around a very large English institute in Poznan, in Western Poland, and asked every speaker he could uh, accost about the past parts of needs plus past parts of construction, and came back with a very interesting information, somewhat shaken, that everybody had told him that he probably took that out of a Polish composition, or that it was non-native English speech. <laughs> this left him in quite a divot because he had sort of counted on his normalness for his whole life, and I had suddenly made the world very ugly for him. <laughs> this is uh, the vowel system that you see in uh, introductory linguistics textbooks. This is what American vowels are supposed to look like. This is, in fact, my vowel system. Uh, this is the vowel system that Peterson and Barney studied in the 1950s uh, from a very large number of speakers who they call speakers of general American, that fictitious dialect which doesn't exist except in my uh, Michigan lecture voice. And this is in fact exactly, in fact, these are not even Peterson and Barney's numbers. These are my numbers, but they lay right on top of Peterson and Barney. So no one could be more normal than me, in spite of what people in Michigan think. These are the vowels that uh, Nancy Nijelski reports for a woman from a Detroit suburb. And you can see that her vowels are abnormal compared to mine. She doesn't have an ah back here like I do. She's got an ah out here. So words like hot for her are not hot, they are hot. Her aw is not up here like mine in caught. Her caught has moved down here, so her caught is more like cut. Her ah is not a perfect low front ah like mine in bag and cat, but it has moved up a little bit and it's more in the bag and cat territory. And before nasals, it's even up at the panda or can or man territory. But I want to call your attention to her owl pronunciation. 